Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. I'm Mary Maté. Hey everybody, thank you for being here. You could be anywhere. There's so much content and you're here. We're so appreciative. And remember, always go to usefulidiotspodcast.com. That's our website. Support the show, get bonus content, including the Thursday Throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness. And extended interviews. So what's not to love? Give yourself that gift. Love yourself and give yourself that gift. Yeah. Well, Aaron, we've talked on this show before about how it's hard for you to do anything but work on your book, tweet and read about politics and the news. So I was really thrilled the other day to see that you actually did something recreational. Uh, I saw you tweet out that you were at an NBA game. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. NBA. Mm -hmm. But even that was uh, tainted by politics. Let's take a look at this tweet. At an NBA game with over 19,000 people and looking around, it's unfathomable that Israel has killed far more people in Gaza with U.S. weapons over the last six months. So that was where your mind went at this NBA basketball game, which, by the way, reminds me of a scene from Zone of Interest where a Nazi is at a party and he can't help but think about how he could gas as many people in the room. Now, I'm not comparing you to a Nazi or anything. I just Thanks. didn't. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so how was the, were you able to enjoy the game at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was able to enjoy the game. Uh, I saw the Knicks play the Kings, Sacramento Kings. And uh, first time seeing NBA live in a long time. And Jalen Brunson is an unbelievable player. He's on the Knicks. Anyway. But yeah, no. How can you look around at all this sea of people, over 19,000 people, and just not think about all the people who have been killed? in Gaza with U.S. weapons. Like everyone there who pays U.S. taxes funded the murder of an even larger crowd of people. So that stadium of over 19,000 people, not even big enough to hold all the civilians who have been killed by Israel in the last six months with U.S. weapons. And it's just, uh, you know, kind of living through a genocide. How can you not think about it constantly? Also at the game, there were you know, so many celebrities always at, Knicks games at the Garden and uh, in attendance that night included uh, two of my favorites, Larry David and Susie Essman of Curb Enthusiasm, my favorite show. But then I was thinking, like, as I'm cheering for them, I'm thinking, like, God, are, you know, what if they're supporters of Israel? I know that Jerry Seinfeld recently attended a talk by ultra Israel apologist Barry Weiss. And Jerry also uh, did a tour of Israel recently. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm thinking, like, well, what if these two people who have made me laugh so hard and who I think are so funny. What if they're also Israel supporters for all right. I know? You know, so yeah. anyway, the point is, in short, Israel Zionism ruins everything. Even the nice things in life are tainted by the fact that, you know, it's we're living through a genocide. You know, were you able I'll, I'll to reach them? Were you able to reach like could you have asked them what their thoughts on uh, Gaza were? I was not sitting close enough to their courtside seats to be able to ask them though. Well, let us know, Larry and Susie. Let us know. Definitely Susie's character would be pro-Israel. Yeah. And there's a funny episode of Curb called Palestinian Chicken where yeah. they explore the issue. And, you know, you can – somebody actually recently shared yeah. a, a scene from that uh, on social media. And uh, some of the lines that were said actually were pretty offensive. They talked about how, like, it's attractive that, like, a Palestinian woman wouldn't – acknowledge Larry's existence a as a Jew or something, or wants right. to like undermine it and he, how turned on by that he was, which is like, it's funny as a comedic concept, but it's playing on a false premise, which is sure. that Palestinians want to deny the existence of Jewish people. No, they just yeah. uh, reject the theft of their land. But anyway, yeah. I, I don't want to quibble with comedy. In that writer's room, Aaron, we could have made it so much better. <laughs> May have suffered comedically, but it would have been the right thing to do. That's the problem. And that's the problem with comedy, I find, is that like uh, when you try to uh, express the politically accurate point, sometimes you, you, you lose some of the comedy. There's just, yeah. unfortunately, it, it kind of works like that. Sometimes, sometimes, not all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But um, John Stewart, actually, to his credit, recently had a good monologue about Palestine. Yeah, he did. I don't know if you saw that. It was good. I did, that yeah. Was it was very good. good. Yeah. And funny. Yeah. So that's how you do it. All righty. Well, shall we move on to the four basic food groups? Yes, let's do it. For Democrats suck, we're going to turn to reliable source of Democrat suckage, which is uh, Nancy Pelosi. And she was recently questioned about the protesters who remain outside of her home or one of her several homes, uh, this one 
in the Bay Area where remember that's where she told people to go back to China and claimed that um, they should be investigated by the FBI for being funded by Vladimir Putin. Right. Well, she still is upset that they're there and she still wants to bring it back to Vladimir Putin. So it's a, it, what, who benefits from it? Donald Trump. Who benefits from Donald Trump? Putin. There's, in my view, a connection there. Between protesters and Putin. Okay. All roads lead to Putin, as Nancy Pelosi once said. Yeah. And uh, even people who don't like genocide and don't like her support for it, it all must tie back to Putin. That's that's the only answer. Yes. Remember when she said, when she actually said all roads lead to Putin, that was when she was talking to Hillary Clinton, right? On a Hillary Clinton podcast. And I'll always remember that because not only was it a great time and you got to hear Hillary Clinton say she would have loved to have seen Donald Trump's call logs because they probably on January 6th, because she assumes they would have gone to Putin. But then Nancy Pelosi said, do you remember I confronted uh, Donald Trump? Remember I was wearing that blue suit? She was very impressed with her outfit choice. That's the famous picture of Nancy Pelosi getting up during a meeting with Trump and I think walking out and pointing the finger at him. And like there's this iconic photograph of that. And we're all supposed to like say, wow, Nancy Pelosi stood up to Trump. But what she said was to him, all ro- with you, all roads lead to Putin. So our opposition leader to Trump was consumed by an insane conspiracy theory. And as good liberals and progressives, we're supposed to like somehow appreciate that. <laughs> you know, and uh, but that but that was her ma- mantra throughout his presidency. W- w- with him, all roads lead to Putin. And um, but uh, Aaron, he's still keeping it going. I think that this is a good, actually unintentional praise of you to call back to you. You like to call conspiracy theorists who believe in RussiaGate blue anon, and she was That's indeed true. wearing that blue suit. She was wearing the blue suit, so she. I mean, look, she is a cult eld- elder blue anon, so the yeah. blue suit is very appropriate. But here's the yeah. thing. Is Nancy Pelosi now tied to Putin? Because guess what? Nancy Pelosi recently, after months of pressure from people outside her home and around the country, asking her to stop being complicit in this genocide, she recently signed on to a letter calling on the U.S. to halt arms transfers to Israel. Check it out. Nancy Pelosi joins the call to stop transferring weapons to Israel. A significant break with Israel by another longstanding supporter. So given that Nancy Pelosi was saying that this was Putin's message before to stop sending weapons to Israel and call for a ceasefire, is Nancy Pelosi now on Putin's payroll as well? And should she be investigated by the FBI? I was just going to say, I think she needs to be investigated by the FBI. Because again, just walk the walk, walk, not just talk the talk. Because again, just as a reminder, this is what she called for. Nancy Pelosi calls for FBI probe into Russia-funded protests against the war in Gaza. So I don't know, FBI, if you have room in your, in your, uh, in your case log, in your, in your case files, let's, let, let's get Nancy Pelosi in there. Investigate Nancy. She That's wants what she would have wanted. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, for Republicans suck, I have a story uh, about a scary thing that happened on Tuesday. Uh, Arizona Supreme Court reinstated a law from 1864 that bans nearly all abortions in the state. This overrides a 15-week abortion ban. This is interesting. The law is 160 years old, and it predates Arizona becoming a state. And it makes reforming an abortion punishable by two to five years in prison, except when the mother's life is at risk. There are no exceptions for rape or incest, and the ban starts at conception. But you know why I think this passed, Aaron? Why? Because there was a prayer in, a pray in, that was coordinated by GOP State Senator Anthony Kern and his prayer team. And they, uh, let's take a look at what they did in the House, the Arizona House. Let it be so, Father God. Let it be so. Let it be so. So they're praying, let it be so. And if there's some, some words that sound unintelligible, that's because they are speaking in tongue. <laughs> And that uh, video was uh, tweeted about and uh, tweeted out by someone who is an activist for Secular Arizona, which is an organization that believes in the separation of church and state. But Anthony Kern, 
had the last word. So let's take a look at this defiant tweet of his. Looks like our prayer team stirred up some God haters like uh, Arizona Dem Party and Pima Dems and Jan Castine, the woman from uh, Secular Arizona. Not to worry, though. Prayer over our state at the state Senate is way more powerful. Crazy. So this was passed. This law is from what? 1864. Yeah. It was passed before women could even vote. It was passed before Arizona was a state. Arizona wasn't even a state. Wow. Um, and it was and- it was null and void, basically, because of Roe v. Wade. But then since 2022, when uh, the Dobbs decision, it's now back in effect. They just ruled it's back and can be back in effect. Wow. And do you think it's actually going to be enforced? I don't know. We'll have to see. I'm, I mean, this is shocking. How can like speaking like electorally, do they like does does the Republican Party think that a majority of the people of Arizona want that crazy law? Like, right. It, Don't they think it'll help get out the vote for Biden? Well, yeah, it's like exactly like they, they seem to be campaigning for Biden if they really because it's like who could possibly support this except for the, the people who are prayer team. praying in tongues. But yeah, that's not the majority of people, I don't think. Right. Well, Aaron, maybe we should pray in tongues for the FBI to investigate Nancy Pelosi. There we go. That's sure. how it happens. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll pray for that. Why not? Yeah. OK, for isn't that weird? We're going to turn to John Bolton, who recently disclosed a bombshell. John Bolton did not vote for Donald Trump in 2020, and he's not going to vote for Donald Trump again, even though John Bolton served under Donald Trump and is a Republican. But John Bolton has disclosed who he did vote for. It wasn't Joe Biden. Uh, It was another Republican. And let's roll the tape. And you've said you're going to write someone in in November. That's what I did in 2020, and I'll do it again this November. Who did you write in in 2020? You've never revealed that before. Well, uh, I I might as well say it uh, now. I voted for Dick Cheney. Wow. And I'll vote for Dick Cheney again this November. You'll write in Dick Cheney. That's right. That's a bombshell, everybody. Who John Bolton voted for in 2020 and 2024. Uh, It was Dick Cheney. Uh, One warmonger votes for another. It's really touching. It's uh, That's solidarity right there. It That's is, yeah. solidarity. WMS. But why should we care who John Bolton voted for or thinks about anything is another question. This is a guy who wanted to dismantle the United Nations building, like like literally wanted to like throw it brick by brick into the Hudson River. Yeah. Uh, this is someone at least who, a couple floors. Just a couple yeah, floors, a floors, Aaron. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, this is someone who um, dragged us into the war with Iraq, who wanted to uh, bomb Iran, you know, just is responsible for p- so many foreign policy disasters, was a key player behind the coup in Venezuela and bragged right, about it. Remember admitted, when, right. Yeah, remember when he went on CNN and he actually defended Trump by saying that, you know, he has experience with coups, uh, given right. what he did in Venezuela and other places. And what Trump did on January 6th was not really a coup. Right. You know, so anyway, John Bolton disclosing his fondness for Dick Cheney as president. I mean, I would I would write in. I would do half of that write in. Dick. You would write in Dick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you heard it here first. That's another bombshell. Well, uh, for isn't that terrible? I'm gonna make. I'm gonna present this in a suspenseful way. So don't show the headline yet, uh, Wilson. Okay. Imagine you are a man staying in the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas, and according to this man. He was awoken by a terrible pain. He says, I just felt like somebody stabbing me in my private area. It felt like a sharp glass or a knife. Do you have any idea, Aaron, what the cause of that was? Guess. I really don't want to. All right. That's fair. Let me show you the picture. Uh, Wilson, no. let's go to a slideshow. Don't worry. Okay. It's not. You don't see the, the, the actual action. You just see the culprit. Mm. Okay. All right. Let's see the photo of the, of the culprit on the boxers. Oh, wow. So people get a sense of it. So there it is. There, The man, after feeling this pain, looked down, put the evidence on his boxers, and here's a close-up. It was a scorpion. Mm. He was stabbed in the testicles by a scorpion. There he is. He laid out the evidence. He put his boxers down on the bathroom floor with the scorpion on it. And he's now taking legal action. Wow. They did comp him. The hotel comped him. Well, that's very kind. That's yeah. very kind. You know, I've never really spent time in Las Vegas. I, I passed through there just one evening and I didn't really want to stay. It's never really interested me. Yeah. 
I find it kind of, uh, it just seems to me the, the crudest expression of capitalism I could imagine yeah. from a, from a city. And this is not making me feel any differently about visiting Las Vegas. In fact, it may make people who like Las Vegas think twice about going there. Yeah. Although I will, I will say this fantastic musical acts. I would visit Las Vegas just for that. There's so many shows you can see there. You can't catch anywhere else. Um, and so I don't want to deter people from visiting Las Vegas. I, I support any form of tourism as long as it's uh, legal um, and safe and safe. Well, I hope that man's okay. And I hope uh, he gets many more free nights. Yeah. You should just move in there, but sleep yeah, he, in like he, jeans. He really deserves his own suite there. Yes. Yeah, he does. Yeah. The scorpion suite. All righty. And that's been your four basic food groups. So we have some bittersweet news, which is that we had a great guest booked, but we had some connectivity issues, connection issues. We don't have a new interview for this week, although there's a chance we're going to connect with her. And if we do. Or him. Or him. There's a chance we're going to connect with them. And if we do, you'll see it because it'll be released as a podcast and video. But if we don't, what we are doing regardless is we are releasing, we are unpaywalling our extended interview with Jeffrey Sack. So all you people who aren't subscribers, although of course you should be at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com, you get an unlocked extended interview with Jeff Sachs this week. And of course, you paying subscribers, you get Thursday Throwdown. The point is, as that Boys to Men song goes, we'll make it up to you. Isn't that how the song goes? I'll make it up to you. Oh, like you, mean, you want me to. I, I, isn't, that, isn't that what it's called? I'll make it up to you? I mean, I knew it traditionally as I'll make love to you, but ah, if, okay, yes. you make, if you're saying you'll make love to the audience, Mm. Um, we may have a lawsuit on our hands. That's true. Yeah, no, I'm not proverbial. promising that. You're only proverbial love. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Via some form of exciting content. Yeah, exactly. To be determined. Yes. Yeah. And we appreciate well, your patience. Problem. You're so lucky because you never would have gotten this Boys to Men collab. collab. <laughs> I'm not sure if Boys to Men authorizes collabs. It's They're, They may not. This is the first non-consensual collab. Collab, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. But maybe they'd be honored. Uh, yeah that we use their song, one of their hit songs, to plead to our audience for forgiveness for not delivering them uh, an interview. Right. The kind of high-quality content they're used to, and we just hope we've given you enough high-quality content. You can forgive us yeah. for our guest's absence uh, this week. We tried very hard to make this interview happen, but it, it, it was it was hard to connect. So we'll do our best, though, and we'll make it up somehow. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll have this guest come through, but if not... Um... It'll be like we've come to the end of the road. Bam. <laughs> Still, I can't let go. Yes. Yes. Uh, all right. Well, that's it. That's uh, how we're ending the show. We're ending it on a profound apology for not having an interview. But stay tuned. Sense. Yeah. Still, the, stay tuned for whatever we come up with. Yeah. And now, without further ado, here is the unlocked section of our interview with the great economist, Jeffrey Sachs. As we're recording this, uh, Joe Biden has just had a phone call with Netanyahu and White House aides are doing the, the familiar dance of leaking to the press that Biden is angry, he's fuming, even though we've just gotten news from the Washington Post that on the same day that Israel killed those aid workers with the World Central Kitchen, Biden uh, uh, sent uh, thousands more bombs to Israel. So that's an indication of how angry Biden is claiming he's angry while sending Israel more bombs. But the White House has just put out a statement, you know, suggesting, I think for the first time, that they might condition their support for Israel on Israel's conduct, specifically with how it addresses civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. Uh, the White House statement says that Biden made clear, quote, that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. So they're saying now for the first time, that they're going to actually shape their policy with consideration of how Israel acts. So they're going to actually tie their policy to Israel's actual conduct. We'll see if they actually do that. But here is White House spokesperson John Kirby speaking about this at the White House. The president had a chance to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu earlier uh, today. On that phone call, the president emphasized that the strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza are unacceptable. He made clear 
the need for Israel to announce and to implement a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. He underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and to protect innocent civilians. And he urged the Prime Minister to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay to bring the hostages home. The two leaders also discussed public Iranian threats against Israel and the Israeli people. President Biden made clear that the United States strongly supports Israel in the face of those threats. That's Ooh. all I have. Did Iran bomb Israel's embassy? <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? Uh, you know, uh, boy, uh, Iran uh, uh, saying uh, nasty things about Israel uh, and uh, we're going to stand behind them. That is maybe that's the most important uh, two sentences of uh, that whole statement uh, that uh, we're getting ready for war with Iran. You know, uh, Biden's frustrated because someone told him, maybe because he's an old man and uh, so on, someone told him he was president. And then he found out he's uh, it's actually President Netanyahu who determines U.S. policy. Uh, and so he is probably frustrated. He's sitting there saying, I thought I was president. No, no, no. Excuse me, sir. But um, uh, it, it's actually Netanyahu who calls uh, U.S. policy. So I actually think they are a little frustrated uh, because um, <laughs> because it's so pathetic to watch them. Uh, and doesn't Tony Blinken bring tears to your eyes like he brings tears to his own eyes every day? wringing his hands about all of the, the suffering and how Israel has to stop this. Uh, the truth is um, the Israel lobby is very powerful. Netanyahu has gotten his way on every single thing. Biden has been pathetic. Uh, it's interesting if uh, the U.S. Uh, is going to actually try to have a U.S. foreign policy. Uh, that would be something new. I wouldn't hold my breath on it, frankly. And again, the weird statement at the end, not that uh, the president uh, uh, spoke in uh, direct terms about uh, Israel's attack on a foreign government, but rather uh, we stand behind uh, Israel <clears throat> when Iran says nasty things after one of their leaders is assassinated is a, a telltale sign of how twisted American foreign policy is. So perverse. <laughs> Un unbelievable. Weird. Uh, yeah. Netanyahu probably will laugh off uh, anything that was said in this call. There's yeah. not likely to be an immediate ceasefire on the basis of this call. By the way, it, I think everybody knows, but we should be clear, the United States doesn't have to convince Israel of anything. All it has to do is stop providing the munitions. Right. So Biden can say, sorry, the munitions stop, period. Right. That's what an immediate ceasefire is. We, we don't have to convince the Israeli government. We have to stop arming the war. That's all. It's, it's actually quite straightforward. And you can that's what, the ceasefire. Yeah, that's, that's what uh, presidents have done in the past when they acted like presidents. This one doesn't. But that's what they would do. They would explain, <laughs> sorry, your war is over. Uh, we're going into a ceasefire. Which is exactly what Biden said to Netanyahu in May 2021, according to uh, a recent book by Franklin Foyer of The Atlantic. He said to Netanyahu, hey, man, it's over, uh, because Netanyahu couldn't give him a clear reason why that assault on Gaza should continue. And so Biden put an end to it. Um, that was May 2021. He will Six months into this genocide, he won't do it now. He just won't do it. And I mean, personally, I don't know how much familiarity you have with Biden, but um, what do you think drives him? Um, with this just unfettered support for Israel. And it's documented that it goes back decades. There's a famous anecdote of even Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin 40 years ago being a little taken aback at how bloodthirsty Biden was uh, in wanting Israel to kill women and children in Lebanon. And Begin had to actually tell Biden, no, uh, we don't go that far. We don't do that. And but Biden just seems totally committed to backing Israel no matter what. He's made up fake claims. He claimed to have seen photos of beheaded babies inside Israel. The White House had to walk that back. He clearly has some sort of deep emotional attachment to Israel. Like, what do you think's going on there? I'm not sure about that. 
Uh, I think he's got a deep emotional attachment to becoming president Hmm. uh, and uh, that he determined early on that never show light with the Israel lobby and and someday you might grow up to be president. Um, So I I really think that this is uh, politics. Uh, I don't think Biden has too many deep attachments uh, to public policy, Uh, not that I've uh, noticed. And I think on this one, this was the politics necessary to get him to the presidency. Then he found out, well, being president isn't as good as being prime minister of Israel. That's the, uh, that, that's the part that frustrates him. Uh, he found out it doesn't have all that much power for the reason that he towed the line for 40 years. So this is, uh, I think, really the dynamic here. Every mainstream U.S. poll for decades has understood don't show even a tiny space with Israel because you'll you'll never live that down. And Biden uh, is nothing but a creature of habit. Uh, and uh, now as an old man, I don't think he, we don't know whether he, he has it in him, you know, in, 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 even really uh, to uh, be able to do differently. But I think that that's been the story all along. He's a very cynical guy, obviously. So this is a a politician, ambitious politician, started young and he wanted to be president and he made it. Shifting gears a little bit, what are your thoughts on the U.S. troops in Taiwan and the uh, attempted ban on TikTok? Well, the troops in Taiwan are one of those things that we'll discuss in a few years when there's a war raging with China. So uh, it's absolutely, absolutely without any sense or any justification conceivable. We have a one China policy, which is the right policy, that there is one China and Taiwan is part of it. And the last time I uh, looked at this, you don't put in your troops uh, into another country over the objection uh, of uh, the power that we have diplomatic relations with. This is absolutely reckless. And it's part of a more reckless strategy, which of course is playing games with the, the one China policy, with sending arms to Taiwan. It's exactly the playbook that led, not exactly, but it's similar to the playbook that led to the Ukraine war. And uh, this one would be even more disastrous for the U.S. and for everybody, but they play with fire. And so there should not be troops on Kenmin Island under any circumstances. If the Taiwanese have any sense, they would know they should not have American troops there. They shouldn't even, if they want to be safe, they should tell America, thank you very much. We, we don't need your weapons right now. This is what the Ukrainians did not understand. I tried to tell the Ukrainian leadership for several years, you know, be careful. You're going to get destroyed. I kept saying you're going to be Afghanistan in Europe. They couldn't believe it because these places think the U.S. has our back. Oh, Yeah. How well has that worked out for decades? Uh, And so uh, if the Taiwanese have some sense, and I really hope they do because I love that place uh, and I would like to see it stay in peace, they would be the first to say, thank you, U.S., maybe calm down. Don't visit us quite so often, please. We, We don't need to see your secretary of state here each time. We don't need your weapons here. We don't need your boots on the ground here. Please show just a little bit of prudence. Give us a little bit of space. This is what's really needed. What is behind the attempt to ban TikTok? Why is there this TikTok hysteria? Well, I think there are two or three or four parts of it. I don't know. I'm not on the inside of it. It is a hysteria. Uh, First, it's part and parcel of the anti-China hysteria, which is a drummed up episode of uh, hegemonic public manipulation. Uh, China's evil. And so anything to do with China is evil. I'm sure 
that's part of it. Uh, we're told, seems quite plausible to me, that TikTok uh, carries uh, stories that uh, U.S. Uh, politicians don't like, such as uh, uh, showing what Israel is doing in Gaza. And so the idea is that if it's brought under proper control, uh, it can cut out the unpleasant stuff from the U.S. Uh, security state point of view. There's truth to that because we know how Facebook and others play along with the U.S. and maybe TikTok doesn't play along quite uh, the same way. So there is uh, the supposed Israel lobby part of the story of uh, trying to get TikTok closed down. There could be the security issue in general. I don't know about this, but the security issue, I believe that anything that isn't owned by American companies makes it harder for the United States government to spy on me. So I think that uh, if TikTok is not in U.S. hands, uh, the U.S. can't spy on Americans uh, as, as easily. So this is my interpretation of Huawei, not that Huawei was going to uh, have China spying on me, but that uh, Huawei equipment would make it uh, harder for the NSA to spy on me. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it may be kind of a purity of our own internal surveillance apparatus uh, that is uh, at stake here. Hard for me to judge. I'm not an expert on this. But uh, it's part of the general control, surveillance, uh, and uh, anti-China hysteria. But exactly what weights to attach to each of those, I'm not sure. Well, you know, on the topic of Ukraine, there is still uncertainty over whether or not House Speaker Mike Johnson will be holding a vote soon on that $61 billion that Biden wants to prolong the war. Uh, Mike Johnson has given conflicting signals. Recently, he said there would be a path, and he talked about uh, a sort of trade-off where Biden approves more uh, gas exports, gas terminals, and also uh, agrees to send some of that money in the form of a loan to Ukraine rather than a grant. Um, but meanwhile, Ukraine is really suffering. And uh, militarily, you know, we're getting headlines like this, which we weren't really getting before. So for example, this is from Politico. Ukraine is at great risk of its front lines collapsing. Uh, and accordingly, Ukraine's recently just lowered the age of conscription uh, from 27 to 25. By the way, at the urging of Lindsey Graham, uh, Lindsey Graham went to Kiev recently and urged Ukraine to uh, send more younger people off to die. And that's what Ukraine is, is now doing. Lindsey Graham famously said that uh, as long as we support Ukraine, they'll fight to the last person. But um, regardless of whether or not Biden gets this money that he wants, the $61 billion. What do you think Ukraine faces in the coming months? And, and also, what does it say that even though this war has been such a disaster, that even the possibility of authorizing more money for it, $61 billion of U.S. taxpayer money is very much a possibility? Yeah. So there, there are a couple of issues here. What does Ukraine face? Uh, it faces uh, continuing massive numbers of deaths on the battlefield and continuing loss of territory. And that's going to continue until there are negotiations to end the war. Uh, everything else that Ukraine's going to even stabilize the situation, much less uh, reclaim territory, much less recapture Crimea are completely false. Uh, and I think that inside they know it, uh, but we get lied to by generals uh, as a matter of course. Uh, and I, I went back actually in the last couple of days uh, to look at what uh, Austin, Secretary of Defense, uh, what Petraeus, that great general of ours, was saying uh, about the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And they were Ukraine's spring counteroffensive, very good chance of success, says Austin, uh, and uh, Ukraine making steady progress in its counteroffensive. And uh, I, I collected these because I thought they were incredible. Russia may suddenly break under pressure from Ukraine's counteroffensive, says former General Petraeus. Uh, and Ukraine's counteroffensive may yet surprise critics, says Petraeus. And Ukraine's counteroffensive will be very impressive, says Petraeus. Oh, baloney. Really, really vulgar stuff. And 
what's happening now is that Ukraine is losing some days a thousand or more people, uh, people that uh, have no training, that have been grabbed off the streets, maybe given two weeks of training or three weeks of training and then sent to their deaths. Uh, and uh, Ukraine's economy is broken. So the idea we're going to give them a loan is, uh, let's just say, uh, economically laughable and politically pathetic. Uh, if if that's the alternative uh, that we don't want to give them money, we're going to give them a loan. Uh, we have something called a Credit Control Act, which is the government would have to give a score how much of that's going to come back. And the score should be five cents on the dollar, I would say, uh, if this were done uh, honestly. So Ukraine will be saved only through negotiations. This has been true all along, by the way. This is not some sudden surprise. This is what objective uh, analysts have been explaining, but you can't find it on the mainstream media, but it's what they've been explaining all along. Not the ones paid for by the military industrial complex, but the ones that are uh, independent have been saying all along that this would happen. So nothing is a surprise about this. Politico, give them a time lag of 18 months to get it right. Uh, they're, they're basically talking about facts that were known a year ago or more. And so if Ukraine's going to be saved, the, the one sentence that would save Ukraine is the opposite of the sentence that Blinken said today. The sentence that would save Ukraine would be a call from Biden to Putin that would say, you know, that idea of expanding NATO to Ukraine, that was a bad idea. Sorry, Vladimir. Uh, we'll stop. You stop. We, we got to end this thing. That actually is how this would end if we had a, a president that, if we had a president that that had capacity. Uh, everything else, uh, everything else is uh, to uh, Ukraine's detriment. More money for Ukraine is more destruction and more loss of territory. We don't even have the munitions in our stockpiles to send them right now. Uh, but what it would mean is Russia will, of course, continue. It's offensive right now. It will intensify the offensive, it will take more territory. Maybe it will take Odessa. Uh, maybe uh, it will reach the Dnieper. Uh, but it's not going to stop as long as Blinken says every day, oh, but it's going to be a member of NATO. Well, OK, if it's going to be a member of NATO, we're going to just continue to take territory. Now, why Johnson, who as a Congressman before becoming speaker opposed all of this with all of the data, all of the current experience, all of the logic, all of the political logic of why bail out Biden on this utter failure, which is Biden's policy going back more than 10 years. Why at this moment pass 61 billion it's a very interesting question, by the way. I don't think that there, I don't have a, a good answer to that, except the, the weight of the military uh, on, on Congress, which is a, so utterly corrupted as an institution. It's so money driven in everything. Maybe enough congressmen are saying, we, we're campaigning, we need the bucks right now. Uh, yeah. And you see, they make the trade off LNG exports. It just shows it's a kind of crass, corrupt, stupid institution right now. So it's a little hard to give a rational explanation for why they would at this moment do another $61 billion, except it's not their money, it's our money, uh, and it's not their lives, it's Ukrainian lives. And why Biden would want that $61 billion, uh, I think the answer is he, he won't make that phone call that you advocated. He won't make the call to Putin, take NATO off the table. Uh, taking, uh, you know, putting Ukrainian neutrality back on the table, which is what Ukraine used to be, just officially committed to neutrality. Absolutely. Uh, he, he and by make... the way, the best explanation of that ever written is an essay by Daniel Ellsberg in 1970 mm. uh, called uh, The Quagmire Myth and the Stalemate Machine. Mm. And what uh, Ellsberg said is, don't think of 
Vietnam as a quagmire that we wandered into and suddenly were sinking up to our waist uh, in, uh, in the swamp. Think of it as a designed stalemate machine where the idea is get us past the next election uh, with whatever lies, soldiers, escalation is needed, but don't admit failure until November. But as Ellsberg pointed out in 1970, after November, then there's the next November. And the way that the Vietnam War ended in the end was not the reality on the battlefield, which had come years earlier, it was that Nixon resigned because of Watergate and a and Gerald Ford was able to stop it because he was an unelected president and it wasn't his thing. So it's otherwise we may still have the Vietnam War. You know, these politicians don't know how to stop when their stupidity has been called by the other side and we are then in this kind of stalemate machine. Of course, the quote stalemate machine isn't really a stalemate. It kills the the uh, the people in the proxy territory, yeah. whether it was Vietnam then or whether it's Ukraine now. I wanted to read you uh, just one line from the New York Times because you mentioned Lloyd Austin talking about how the counteroffensive in Ukraine had a really strong chance of success. So you compare that with what the view is in the Pentagon now. This comes from the New York Times recently. The Times said this, at the Pentagon, some officials say they do not consider last summer's efforts to have been a counteroffensive at all. So it was such a failure that they can't even give it the name counteroffensive at the Pentagon after their leader, Lloyd Austin, was predicting that it was going to have success. And I guess the obvious question for me that comes from that is, if you can't even call this counteroffensive a counteroffensive, uh, despite the fact that it was heavily planned, this was months in the making. You know, the Pentagon was out in Germany at an air force base consulting with Ukraine and their allies, pouring in weapons to prepare for this. If you can't even now call that a counteroffensive, how possibly could you expect Ukraine now, in in a far worse position, to accomplish anything more? It just seems you can't. so absolutely suicidal. You, you can't. And it's not suicidal. It's a, uh, it, it's a murder of Ukrainians by Americans. Uh, it, uh, you know, I, I said recently uh, that it was uh, the Biden and Schumer plan to kill more Iranians. Uh, th- this is uh, not suicide. Uh, of, of course, it's also a crime by Zelensky and his, uh, his government, which is now uh, just a martial law government, after all because uh, they also sold uh, uh, a story to their people. Uh, Maybe they believed it themselves. I begged them not to believe it. I tried to give them all the evidence. Boy, did they hate me for it. They didn't want to hear any of it. Uh, But I tried to explain to them how bad this was going to be for them. But the point is the politicians don't want want to say failure. And as long as they keep voting, uh, 61 billion every now and then, uh, they don't have to say failure, even when the failure is uh, graveyards all over Ukraine and uh, staring us in the face every day. They just don't want to admit that they were wrong. And uh, we end up closer and closer to total disaster of one kind or another as a result of this. Biden is a miserable failure uh, in all of this, he's been at it for a long time, uh, and it's been a disaster, and it continues to this day. Jeffrey Sachs, we are very grateful for your time and insight. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, great to be with you guys. Thanks for all the, all the wonderful work you do. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.